members for comprehensive ophthalmologist. I will request uh, Dr. Prashant Bhavan Pillai to start off with his talk on recognizing and managing early end ophthalmology. Shalom. Thank you, Dr. Raja. I would be speaking on recognizing and managing early end ophthalmitis, the common mistakes. I would initially present eight to 10 cases to just highlight certain things from each of the case. This is case number one, a non-diabetic 73 years old male underwent a cataract, phaco, uneventful phaco surgery for a heart bound cataract. And he had a severe inflammation and advised elsewhere with subconjunctival antibiotics and oral steroids. And when they presented to us, he had corneal SK, a bit of hypopion two millimeters. And when we had a slit lamp retro elimination, we could see a good glow. And on an indirect ophthalmoscopy, vitreous was clear. So diagnosis was naturally not an infective variant. It was a traumatic or a TAS. And we treated with topical steroids and cycloplegic, stopped the oral steroids. And this was the picture six hours later. So hypopion does not necessarily mean infection each and every time. Retroillumination and indirect ophthalmoscopy ruled out vitreous involvement. That meant it was not an infective variant. Now coming to case two, a 38 years old male who had undergone a vitreous surgery, had a grade three cataract with PSC, underwent a cataract surgery, again presented with a CV inflammation. You can see some corneal SK, hypopion about two millimeter. B scan was done and you could see some vitreous opacities. Patient was diagnosed as a case of endophthalmitis again elsewhere and was referred to us. But this were residual silicon oil opacities because of the vitreous, uh, uh, he had undergone silicon oil removal earlier. We just treated with topical steroids and cycloplegic as the indirect ophthalmoscopy permitted us visualization of the retina. And this was six hours later, 24 hours later. So in a post vitrectomized eye, this eyes react more severely. So also the younger patients and you should be aware that on a sonography, the opacities need not be necessarily cells, but it can be silicon oils residue, especially in a vitreous post vitrectomy eye. Case three, 50 years old diabetic patient who had undergone panretinal photocoagulation, anti-VEGF, underwent uneventful cataract surgery for cataract, and he, this was his inflamed eye. On a B scan, he had minimal vitreous involvement. We again put a trial of topical steroids and cycloplegic, and he responded beautifully. And so we need to remember in a diabetic patient, the you have a, a changes in the iris called diabetic iridopathy, which shows rigid pupil depigmentation, which leads to more severe an inflammation. Case four was a heart cataract three days ago who had undergone diminution since two days, diabetic under treatment. And he was given oral steroid and look at the sugars. He had, he, when he presented to us, we did a random sugar. It was 458, a diabetic patient. And this was the presentation almost hypopion, full hypopion, the uh, base scan shows to, uh, severe uh, involvement of vitreous cavity. And so one needs to understand there is no role of oral steroids whenever you suspect a case of a endophthalmitis. So also in a diabetics, you should never use steroids, oral steroids. Yes, diabetic patients can have severe fibrinous reaction as we saw in the previous case and endophthalmitis in second case. And here you have to be more vigilant and more careful about making a diagnosis. Case five, non-diabetic cataract surgery done three months ago, chronic endophthalmitis received multiple intravitreal injections elsewhere. And this was the presentation and he was referred to us for vitrectomy. And this was the presentation. When we did a B scan for this patient, he had a biconvex type of a presentation. This was probably a nucleus drop and this poor guy was receiving intravitreal antibiotic. The patient, uh, the surgeon had not done B scans for this. And so is the importance of doing a B scan whenever you're not having, having a media opacity to put up. And we did vitrectomy for this patient without any intravitreal antibiotics. And that is how it helps you, a B scan can help. Yeah, with steroids, of course. Then coming to case six. Pardon? No, sir. Yeah, I think the contact time in an infusion is hardly over there where it will get diluted. So if you have to give, I might give an IVTA following a surgery. Point one ml, that's it. Okay. Because the dexamethasone has a very short half-life, okay. which is a few hours. Okay. Yeah. 
So then case six, non-diabetic grade three, he had a asteroid hyalysis, extended rexis with PCT and no vitreous loss. And this was the presentation elsewhere. These are the photographs we had taken from patients five. He had vitreous opacities. And if you look at it, when we uh, patient was given topical steroid cycloplegic antibiotic, but look at this particular parameter. It was done at 70 decibels. And so I think it went a bit wrong. And when we did it three hours later, this patient had such severe opacity. And so whenever you are assessing a vitreous cavity for vitreous involvement, it has to be done at a high gain. That is what we learn. Never do it at a lower gain where you can miss a vitreous opacities. And then this was a case of a acute endophthalmitis received. Then we had to treat him with necessary intravitreal antibiotics. Case seven, history of cataract surgery done two days ago, sudden diminution of vision, non-diabetic patient, B scan done elsewhere. Again done at a 70 decibels, minimal vitreous opacities. Provisional diagnosis again by the referring doctor was TAS. And treatment was uh, steroid style, cycloplegic antibiotic was given. When he presented to us, you can see some sutural infiltration over here. And a B scan again done at a high gain showed such significant vitreous involvement. And so what we learn from this particular case is, you need to do B scan at a higher gain. And um, important thing is, if you see a sutural infiltration, do not have a wishful thinking, rather accept that it is an infective and start treating it and refer it. Case eight, this patient had undergone trauma 10 years back, young patient, he had a fibrotic anterior capsule. He underwent uneventful cataract surgery and he had a inflammation, such a severe inflammation of the anterior segment. We thought it is going to be an ACAD, and ACAD, for information, I will tell you what it is. It is a sterile inflammation, and treatment given was topical steroid and cycloplegic, and he responded well. So what is ACAD? That is anterior chamber associated immune deviation, which happens because of the immune reaction, what the body has always been exposed to the proteins for, uh, pre because of the trauma. This is case nine, uneventful cataract surgery in a non-diabetic patient. He had inflammation, so treated elsewhere with oral and subconjunctival antibiotic post-surgery. And this is how he presented to us about a day later. So whenever in doubt, please do not use subconjunctival. Various studies have very clearly shown that there is no role of periocular steroid uh, antibiotics in management of suspected cases of endophthalmitis. Neither only systemic antibiotics help. If you have to treat these cases, you need to treat with Medical management means intravitreal antibiotics. Case 10, pseudophagic received anti for certain retinal conditions, and this was the presentation, six hours. And then this was thought to be sterile inflammation, treated elsewhere with topical steroid and cycloplegic, again a wishful thinking, and 12 hours later, the deterioration. He underwent vitrectomy, and we could salvage. Intravitreal antibiotics, if you have given any intravitreal injections, remember, any form of hypopion, be more suspicious. It is always better prudent to think it as an infective rather than treating it as an uh, infective variant. But importance is that in the event if you are treating it with a topical steroids, do repeat an examination about five to six hours later, again on a slit lamp, and then you can catch the disease young. This is another case which received anti with a IVTA and was thought to be a this was thought that it is a precipitate, steroid precipitate, IVTA precipitates in vitreous. But look at the characteristics of this precipitate. These are ball-like uh, structures, and these are not the typical things. It is more of a fungal. So pseudo-inflammation after IVTA looks at, you have a quiet eye with a sterile hypopion, and the precipitates in the vitreous looks something like this. It does not look like a ball-like appearances over there. Case 12. Again, this patient had undergone cataract surgery a few months back, on and off in uh, flare-up of inflammation treated with topical steroids. And this is how he presented. And when you look at the fundus, uh, at the posterior capsule, there was a plaque. When we treat a vitrectomy with intravitreal vancomycin, he responded beautifully well. So plaque on the posterior capsule, you can confuse it with a posterior capsular opacification. But do remember, if it is associated with multiple episodes of inflammation, do not forget this particular condition. This is the last case. This is case 13. Again, a patient who had undergone grade 4 cataract surgery, uneventful surgery, multiple episodes of pain, redness, responding to topical steroids. And on presentation, this was the thing when he presented to us for an opinion. You could see that the, there was minimal inflammation in the anti-segment. Posterior capsule was clear. And 
the patient had uh, it was reported as posterior pole was normal it, this was the findings on the patient's record and it naturally it was done only with direct ophthalmoscopy but when we did an indirect ophthalmoscopy we could see such cotton ball appearances importance is that whenever you have chronic endophthalmitis do evol evaluate the patient with indirect ophthalmoscopy especially the inferior vitreous many a times inferior vitreous will show such things which will give you a clue about the diagnosis we did a vitrectomy and he responded beautifully well so whenever in doubt whenever there is an inflammation you have to go back to the thing whether it was a more traumatic surgery predisposed eye these are the cases which are surgical trauma is there naturally inflammation is more likely to be because of infl uh, sterile in nature but these are the set of patients who are more predisposed otherwise also to inflammation and so i will come whenever you are having any doubts it is always prudent enough to think that it is a case of a endophthalmitis rather than having a wishful thinking of it being a sterile one so whenever in doubt you always do acquire a sample either from the antechamber or from a vitreous and give intravitreal antibiotics that is the way to manage whenever in doubt or repeat an examination six hours later never use oral steroids in event if you feel it is sterile just a topical steroid intensive topical steroid with cycloplegic is more than needed and repeat an examination 6 hours later that's the way we treat whenever you are in doubt thank you thank you dr prashant uh, i think uh, for the uh, sake of the audience in the sense although we have repeated at the end we started off with some cases which resolved with topical antibiotics uh, and steroids so the point here to make is uh, we should not be always be carried away that this is probably just a post-op inflammation. So can you just repeat what are the key points anyone should look at again? I probably, it's but worth emphasizing again, what you should look for in a case of that. Most important thing is forget about the wishful thinking. Do a slit lamp examination, a post-operative case having an inflammation more than anticipated do a good slit lamp examination. On a slit lamp examination, look basically for wound uh, structure, whether it is inf uh, whether any infiltration is there, antechamber flare cells and all has to be noted. If antechamber inflammation is associated with vitreous involvement, how do you look for it? By slit lamp biomicroscopy on a retro illumination, if you get a good glow, unlikely that is vitreous is involved at this point of time. If uh, then do an indirect ophthalmoscopy, look for the vitreous adequately. If you are seeing structures, vitreous is quite, then it is likely to be sterile. Give a dose of, uh, a trial of topical steroids and cycloplegic. No, never give oral steroids at this point of time. Six hours later, do repeat an examination again. That is most important. And after you repeat an examination, if you see that it is worsening, it is prudent enough to think it has an infective variant and treat him with a single intravitreal antibiotic injection. And that would save, uh, salvage most of the eyes. Thank you very much. Uh, are you ready, Dr. Chobit, with the slides? Anand, till the time they are set up, do you have any comments? Yeah, I think uh, probably the most important thing which has been emphasized in this presentation is that, uh, you know, you have to be, you have to have that clinical suspicion about that. And also another thing I'd just like to add is uh, don't hesitate from doing a B-scan if, you know, the media is uh, very hazy and I mean, I think that's that's also something which is critical. Also, I, we don't think that intravitreal antibiotics is the purview of only retina specialists. I think all ophthalmologists, this is something which is uh, emphasized even in postgraduate courses for a long time now. So intravitreal antibiotic delivery of that, even if you don't have a retina surgeon coming to your practice uh, regularly, I think it uh, behoves you that you should have uh, the intravitreal antibiotic available in your uh, setup in your OT this thing uh, oral lab I don't want to push that but oral lab has an e-kit which you know is just one dose it can just pull all the do doses are there and that so you can definitely put that in so uh, that is something which we would uh, you know insist that you know that uh, skill and that uh, suspicion should be there are you ready sir Dr. Shobit yes are yeah. you ready? thank you so now I invite Dr. Shobit Chawla to present uh, the do's and don'ts after nucleus drop so as we know, PCR occurs in approximately 1% of FACO cases. And those who patients who have this can have simple pain to corneal edema, CME, retinal detachment, exaggerated inflammation, 
and a simple PCR without a vitreous loss can be concluded as a routine procedure, while a large PCR with fragments and tildy can be managed by anterior vitrectomy and pars plana, uh, pars plana needle levitation of fragments and emulsification. Once lens matter is in vitreous, it has to be a complete vitrectomy. So avoid panic, stay calm, PCR is not a crime. Avoid over manipulation in anterior chamber as it increases damage to the endothelium and post-op inflammation. Fishing of any kind in the vitreous to remove lens fragment is an absolute no. It can cause endothelial damage, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal break, and even detachment. So when to intervene after a lens drop? After a new there are a lot of papers on this, and most of them prove that uh, on the pathology basis, no inflammatory cells were found when pars plana vitrectomy was performed within three days of cataract surgery. Inflammatory cells occurred in 35% specimens when vitrectomy was performed between four to seven days and occurred in 80% of eyes that had the removal of the lens fragment 61 to 90 days. So the more you wait, there is more damage, more inflammation. How to proceed? In a VR setup, if a surgeon is available and a VR setup is there, immediate retrieval of lens fragments with a pars plana approach is the preferred technique. If a VR surgeon is not available, a bimanual anterior vitrectomy to remo remove the prolapsing vitreous into the anterior chamber without any further damage to posterior capsule, ensures a round pupil, re re relieves all vitreous traction and decreases incidence of post-operative CME and RD. If there is adequate anterior capsular support, go ahead with the sulcus implantation. <coughs> if inadequate, can be an ACIOR or a secondary implant or a scleral fixation or glued, whatever your expertise lies in. So it has been proved that they are removed sooner rather than later. And those who have had the vitrectomy within seven days after cataract uh, surgery typically had better final visual acuity than those who had uh, from eight to 30 days. So we routinely follow the approach that it has to be a one surgery. If the nucleus drop occurs, it's surgery on the same day, same time before the pa patient goes out of the OT, if, as if nothing happened. Not all types of retained lens fragments are managed the same way. Small amount of retained cortical material. In fact, if you do a routine FACO, you, when you finish, you, you find there are some cortical materials floating always, even with an intact bag and intact zonules in the anterior vitreous, which, are, which escape from between the zonules. And, uh, they, every uh, case does not require a vitrectomy. The vitrectomy approach we prefer is the pars plana approach, and many times we resort to a hybrid vitrectomy if the nuclear fragment is uh, if the nuclear fragment is uh, it's not showing the advanced rod, so. In a little tough cases, uh, you find that the incidence is higher and you have to resort to vitrectomy like this was a non-dilating pupil. So we converted to a, because we had a drop immediately as soon as we entered, we don't, maybe it was a polar which was not diagnosed and we go ahead with the vitrectomy. So when the nucleus is very hard, you may not be able to uh, do a vitrectomy in the regular manner, and you might require a bimanual approach. This is a case of simple cortex where you are able to crush and treat the patient's uh, nucleus very easily, while another case, uh, it's always a good idea to treat these eyes with a posterior hyaloid removal and a complete vitrectomy so as to avoid later on complications of 
epiretinal membranes, cystoid macular edema, and even the incidence of retinal detachment is much less. This is the routinely followed approach. But this is all right when the nucleus is easy and soft, but there may be a case where the nucleus is not easy and soft, and you might be required to do more than this procedure, uh, what we call as a bimanual chopping in many of these cases. So this is just a simple implantation on the sulcus, in the sulcus on the remaining capsular support, and the case is over. Where another patient where the nucleus is absolutely rock hard, we take a bimanual approach where we use the phragmatome as a fixation device after a good vitrectomy. You can take, I, nowadays we use chandelier, this is an older video where I was using illuminated infusion ports and this is a procedure which we like to do routinely for very hard nucleus because it decreases uh, the you know brunt of the surgery on the eye and makes it a very easily reproducible and uh, easy procedure. So we take an irrigating chopper and we have a after completing a reasonable vitrectomy I'll just show you the beginning of the chopping and after that so after a good vitrectomy and loosening the nucleus that's the irrigating chopper so you have two infusions going in because you are you going to be using high energy you don't want to cause scleral burns also in case there is milk formation at the tip which is a sign of total occlusion of the tip so use the uh, phragmatome as a fixation device and you do a like an anterior segment chopping in the posterior segment so this is a technique we were also one of the developers in long time back. We now be, we've be, been doing this for nearly 15 years. And it's a very easily reproducible and good technique for this compromised situation. And that's how you finish the case. And you leave the eye as if nothing has happened. Some reflections on retained lens material, it's frequently a two surgeon situation requiring expertise and cooperation and communication between the cataract and VR surgeon. When a drop nucleus is encountered, IOL placement should be attempted by the anterior segment if sulcus is stable, because we can easily use phragmatome. All larger wounds should be sutured to prevent hypotony and reduce complications during uh, pass vitrectomy. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Shobit. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, if not, then uh, we'll have uh, our next speaker, <coughs> Dr. Anand Rajendran, who will uh, talk about intravitreal injections in DME. Good morning. Uh, everybody, it's a pleasure to be here at this uh, capsule, and it's a pleasure to have those that have come on this early in the morning. So I'm going to talk to you about management of DM, uh, uh, diabetic macular edema and a bit of you know, in a do's and don'ts there. So, you know, the management of DME has moved from the spy laser photocoagulation in the 80s to the turn of the millennium where we had steroids coming in and then to the current era of intravitreal antiragus, which basically bevacizumab, uh, ranizumab, and eflibrifed hold the fort. So the approach I'm going to take is to look at the current basic principles governing DME treatment, look at the factors that assess need to be assessed and, uh, and letting us know how to spike thereafter. So Resolve clearly showed us that Ranizab had very high efficacy versus sham. Uh, DRCR protocol, I went further and looked at uh, the different uh, modalities available. The Ranizab laser in combination arm was shown to be decidedly better than laser or IVTA laser, and that differing combination laser was better than doing prompt laser. As was seen in this two-year uh, equity plot where the combination arms with Ranizumab did far better than laser only or IVTA and prompt laser. So the first thing is anti-injection should be a first option. The second thing is avoid putting in prompt laser 
and prompt laser and IVP are no longer first of options for us. So the equity plot at three years and at five years showed an advantage for deferring laser in this combination. And so with the reducing reduction of macular edema, where again deferred laser was better. Early intense treatment reduces treatment burden later. This is something very important that came through, as you can see in this plot, in the first year, in both the arms, eight and nine injections, and then subsequently drops off dramatically, two and one and three and two injections in the subsequent years, which seems to suggest that it's important to get a grip on the disease earlier. Do not hesitate in being intensive with your treatment upfront. Something you should share with your patients. Tell them that if you, if we go early hard, then subsequently it becomes easier in the following years and diabetic macular edema is not a one-off disease, it's going to be a chronic affair, so we need to be like that. And up to 43% of patients really required no injections in year three. Then higher safety issues were noted for IVPA in terms of elevated intraocular pressure as well as cataractogenesis. So higher safety issues are an issue. Uh, Rice and Wright showed us something very important that in untreated eyes, it's never too late for anti vagus therapy and chronicity is not as big a deal as we sometimes make it out to be. So you see here in this plot, equity plot, you see that the uh, uh, sham arm did not get off the baseline up to two years. So for two years, these patients carried that amount of macular edema and the moment they were open or fed with Lucentis, the equity plot almost magically starts snaking up. And the same likewise seen with the macular edema, the moment these patients were given Lucentis, it starts drying off. So do not hesitate in treating chronic DME if there are no degenerative uh, uh, signs around. Restore showed us the same thing with lasered only eyes. So again, never too late for anti vagus treatment, chronic is not a big deal. And that secondly, counterintuitively, adding laser didn't seem to reduce ranibizumab retreatment rates, which we think is the USP for laser. As is seen in this plot here, so you see that blue line at the bottom, that was the laser only arm. For one year, these patients had only laser initially and nothing else, and you see it hardly improves. And then moments uh, 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 Lucentis was given to these patients, you see that equity starts picking up. And at the end of three years, lo and behold, it actually catches up with the combination arm. The corollary to this is that it doesn't seem to make a difference whether you add ranizumab to the laser one year after laser or immediately at the start. At the end of three years, they end up at the same time point. So the key is do not hesitate in treating, don't hold your hand in treating DME even if it appears to be chronic. And this shows that the number of re-injections was the same in all the treatment groups. So adding laser doesn't necessarily reduce your re-injections. Bolton Vista showed efficacy for bevacizumab and aflibizumab respectively, and it was DRCRT, which uh, protocol T, which showed, compared these three modalities, these three injections, and they gave us two clear messages, that there was, there was definitely higher efficacy for aflibizumab and ranibizumab over bevacizumab in poor vision patients, that is less than or equal to 2550, and secondly, of the three, bevacizumab clearly reduces macular edema the least. So this equity plot shows the same thing, aflibizumab and ranibizumab being better than uh, bevacizumab, the poor vision patients, and it also reduced macular edema the least. So these are the regimens, now how do we dose? Monthly dosing, TRN, and then treatment extent came in. And of course, we know monthly dosing is not practical, there's risk of infection, huge economic burden time, though it is the most effective. PRN is very strict, this usual equity and OC based criteria. So the retain study was the first one which really did a head to head uh, study of uh, um, treatment extent versus PRN. And they found that at the end of two years, there wasn't really any significant difference uh, between the two regimens. Bivordex study was the first which did a head to head comparison of Osodex and Bevacizumab about 88 patients. You see on the left, the equity plot at two years shows that bevacizumab did better than dexamethasone. But then if you look at the subset of patients which are pseudophagic, they were more or less similar. When you look at the mean central macular thickness, interestingly it finds that de dexamethasone seems to reduce that macular edema the most and fastest. And at one year it did better, but at the end of two years, it was more or less the same. So Osodex can be an option in pseudophagic patients. So this is a month treatment mantra, monthly anti vagus injections until the patient is stable, which means equity and OCD more or less unchanged over two to three visits. And then you can go in for weight and extend or treat and extend. A weight and extend if you have uh, mitigating factors like a, a little bit of degeneration and stuff and you don't want to be very aggressive, then you can extend follow up after two months. But if the edema is still clean, then you may uh, go in for treat and extend. And then up to the point where it's stable and then you extend follow up after three months, if it still remains unstable, then you go back to treat and extend. So if the dosing is inadequate, you would do that. If dosing is adequate, you've done a lot of injections, then you can switch it, move from Avastin onto Accentrix more commonly or vice versa. So this is a patient who 
benefited was refractory to avastin after many injections and then benefited with Accentrix. And the opposite was also true, but less commonly. So switching in drugs in refractory cases is useful. And this was also seen in, has now been corroborated in various studies which have switched drugs between uh, uh, ranibizumab and uh, eflabicept. So elderly pseudophage, IVTA is an option. Ozodex comes into its prime really in vitrectomized patients as seen in the study by Boyer et al. who showed a definitive advantage of Ozodex in post-vitrectomy diabetic macular edema patient. These, in this situation, Ozodex is the only one which retains its pharmacokinetics, and so uh, this is one place where it just really holds a primary role. So that's number 15, wh it's vital in post-TTV DNA. Then the Mead study sub-analysis showed that dexamethasone had great utility in uh, refractory DMA cases where all other options uh, have been tried. Then came the question of combining anti-VEGF treatment with steroids. Does that help? So Protocol U answered that question when they found that adding dexamethasone ranibizumab really offers no significant advantage and uh, in terms of equity, though re uh, macular edema reduction was there. Sohail and Wang showed that adding IVTA to Avastin offered no significant advantage. And this is another thing that again was looked at. What about the background effect? They focused on the macular edema, but what about the background? So there are enough and more studies now which show that repeating anti vegf also benefits the background diabetic retinopathy status. So that's something you can also share with your patients and motivate them to uh, pursue uh, uh, anti vegf treatment. So in essence, in finally, uh, ERM vitrectomy, obviously one should keep an uh, eye out for those surgical conditions and vitrectomy to be done there. Uh, future directions, subthreshold micropulse is coming in. People have, mix, have had mixed experience with this. Illuvian is... Uh, great option for chronic edema is expensive, it's still not come to the market, we look for that. Octroplus and Sacidil, ALG Lunate are all things which are happening in the background. Other alternatives that have tried uh, increase uh, frequency of injection, dr dose hike, drug cocktail, drug holidays, and limited vitrectomy with or without iodine sealing. So these are all the options that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anand. Uh, are there any questions for either uh, Dr. Shobit Chawla or uh, Dr. Anand Rajendran? So I think... Uh, any questions? No, we now invite uh, Dr. Raja Narayanan uh, for his talk on common mistakes in OCT interpretation. So all these talks are directed for the comprehensive ophthalmologist. Yeah, so good morning uh, once again and thank you Dr. Shobit. Uh, so I'll be trying to touch upon the common modality which we all have now of OCT. But again, there are some technicalities or some pearls which may not really know and we sometimes get uh, carried away by some of the common mistakes. So in essence, for any ophthalmologist now, not just retina specialist, it has become very important to know the OCT and the OCT related anatomy of the retina. It has become as common as ophthalmoscopy. Uh, or sometimes I may say even more common than ophthalmoscopy in the sense some of the people don't even try to look at the retina, just advise OCT and get back the report. But we should know what could be the mistakes sometimes it can happen. So for that we should have a very good understanding of the layers of the retina because each and every point which we may see, we should be able to correlate and decide whether the pathology is worth treating or observing. So in terms of uh, macular degeneration, the etiological classification is extremely important because CNVM is just a sign. It is not a disease by itself. There are many, many causes of choroidal neovascular membrane. Some of the pictures are uh, representing some diseases here, right from macular degeneration to choroidal osteoma, which is on the top left. Then you have high myopia on the bottom left, which is the second most common. Then you have others like uh, injured streaks, inflammation. So there are so many causes of CNVM. So what are the types of CNVM which are based on the OCT? You can have uh, type 1 CNVM, which is below the RP, or type 2 CNVM, which is above the RP, although both are choroidal neovascular membranes, which arise from the choroid, but if it is limited to below the RP, they behave differently. They behave differently if you don't treat. They also be treat, uh, behave differently when you treat. They need more number of injections. 
Type 2 is above the RP and type 3 is within the retina called retinal angiomatous proliferation. So this is an example of uh, type 1 CNVM where you see most of the, it's only the RP elevations, fibrovascular PED. Above the RP there is no CNVM. And then here you see another case where you can note that above the RP there is a choroidal neovascular membrane with subretinal fluid. And then you have the type 3 CNVM which I mentioned was intraretinal. Here you see within the retina you see the reflectivity and there is only subretinal fluid. There is nothing under the RP here. So what are the differences? Okay, let's imagine that we found out that one is beneath the RP, one is above the RP. So what, what happens to the patient? You still have to inject, but what are the differences? So we must uh, make sure that the CNVM which we are dealing is ARMD or some other cause of the CNVM. Typically CNVM due to ARMD is type 1 beneath the RP whereas any other non-ARMD CNVM, classic CNVM, it is not common to see in ARMD but more common in myopic CNVM, inflammatory, osteoma, injured, basically other causes of CNVM other than ARMD. And then the other point to note is type 1 CNVM which is under the RP, it progresses slowly. If you don't treat them, they progress slowly and respond very slow, meaning you need to have give many, many injections in these patients like ARMD CNVM. So if a patient of ARMD has come and uh, they say that, you know, I have some function at home, I have some travel, can I come after two weeks for injection? It is possible if it's a type 1 occult CNVM, whereas in a type 2 CNVM, let us say myopic CNVM, that patient is, has to be taken like an emergency and you have to treat it immediately. But the good thing is the type 2 CNVM, they resolve rapidly also. With, the, with a few injections, they will go away completely. You don't have to give multiple injections over one year, two years, three years. Whereas the ARMD CNVM, you may have to give the injection the third year also, fourth year also. So type 1, you can do based on the OCT, you may be able to see which ones are going to be chronic. I'll just uh, skip uh, some of the slides here in the interest of time. One important difference between the regular ARMD and Indian conditions is the polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, which we see more common in our population, where you see a lot of exudates, you see uh, large PEDs, and you also see a double layer sign, that is the splitting of the RP and the Brooks membrane. And ICG usually confirms the polyps, as you can see on the right side here, this patient has polyps. Now there are some other newer terminologies and newer findings which have been described. One of them which is important to know is not every hyporeflective or black space on OCT is fluid. So that means not every black space has to be treated with an injection. There is something called outer retinal tubulation which are seen in chronic cases of macular degeneration where they are lined by a hyperreflective wall like a cyst. These suggest of chronic changes and not necessarily activity, so you can just observe these patients. What about subretinal scar? You can see this high reflective lesion and the fundus photo also shows a nice scar. There is no fluid. These also should not be treated. This is one example I would like to show where we have to use our clinical judgment, not just the OCT photos. So this patient from West Bengal, a 42-year-old male, had already received a couple of injections in the left eye. Right eye shows a pigmented scar, but the left eye shows a yellowish lesion here. And uh, this patient had a 624 vi vision in the left eye. You see some subretinal fluid and a hyperreflective lesion. So a diagnosis of CNVM had been made outside, but not everything which is yellow is a CNVM. So in spite of two injections, there was no response in this patient. But as you can see here, the RP is absolutely intact in this patient. So in a CNVM, even if the lesion CNVM comes above the RP, there will be disruption of the RP because it has to come from the choroid. But here in this case, the RP is completely intact. We just did an FA and it shows a very nice ink blot leakage, which is typical of CSR, central serous retinopathy. So there was no CNVM. And we did a laser, Navilas laser to that leaking point and this is pre-laser and this is post-laser. There was no injection which was given to this patient from our side, just a focal laser resolved this lesion. So this was just subretinal fibrin. So everything which is subretinal is not necessarily a CNVM. 
The other mistake which a uh, lot of people make is looking at just one scan on the OCT. Any fluid we t want to inject, but look at it carefully, examine the patient, does it match? Why is there fluid? Why is there a CNVM? These are the questions which we should have in the clinic when we see the patient. So this was a patient who had brought an OCT uh, and uh, someone had advised intravital injection because there is macular edema and subretinal fluid. But they had not mentioned why there is macular edema. What is the pathology of this case? So when I examined this patient, I could not find any reason for the macular edema and I didn't find any hemorrhages, no exudates. So I did my own OCT again and what I saw was actually this is a macular hole. So every macular hole has a cystic changes around the wall of the macular hole, the edges. And if you take the scan around the edges of the macular hole, this is what you will see. So you should see all the scans and you should examine the patient thoroughly. So a GLUT clinician will look at all the scans, correlate with fundus examination and repeat fundus examination when in doubt. So a GLUT clinician relies more on clinical cells than just the tests alone. So here I am showing uh, one intravitreal injection being performed by a cataract surgeon. But again, while it is necessary to learn all these skills and because a lot of patients have diabetes, we need to take care of them. But it is important to get trained in all these skills, both OCT interpretation and injection. So this cataract surgeon has just touched the lens and the OZX has been injected inside the lens and has, is doing a FACO. And then what you will see is that the OZX injection is, has been also fake would by itself. So if at all you want to do any injections, take care of retina cases, better to get some training of at least the OCT interpretation and uh, doing intravitreal injections. So thank you very much for your kind attention. We end this session now. If there are any questions, we will be happy to answer them. Uh, we just want to know a couple of times when we do OCTs and we find small little RP detachments. And we are, whatever try we try to investigate, we have not been able to come to any conclusion. As you said, you must come to the diagnosis before treating. These patients, if they are not macular uh, area, they are fine. They are incidentally found. So do, can you give us some idea what do we do for these patients? No, you mean an RP detachment Small away from the fovea? Or away the from the fovea, asymptomatic patient, routinely we suspect when you look at the retina that there are certain elevated lesions. And we do a scan and we find these are an innocuous. They remain like this for months. No, and you years. don't need to do anything for them. So what are they? Yeah. I'm... I'm <laughs> So, good question. Yes, there are two possibilities. One, obviously, I'm sure you will, uh, you have enough clinical judgment that if you see drusens, you can add drusenoid PD. So but you are ruling out drusen. You are totally, saying that, yeah. Totally, yes. So, there are cases which are quiescent or non exudative CNVMs. If you do an OCT angiography, you will be able to pick up the flow. But the point here is, even mm. if you pick up the flow, but there's no fluid on OCT at this True. time, you just do a regular normal OCT. Okay. You may not have OCT angiography, but if you just have uh, RP elevation, most probably, if you are ruled out drusen, it's probably in a non to CNVM, but you don't have to treat them. You just have to follow them up unless there is fluid. But non to CNVM are non-progressive or they progress? They may progress. So that's another talk I have. But non to CNVM may be inactive for even two years. Okay. Or even six months, but you need to so monitor them carefully. To monitor them and just the presence of CNVM with no fluid is not an indication to treat. Just sharing an experience, yesterday I had a patient who had been injected in the right eye. There was no fluid on OCT. There was a little scarring and the left eye showed a central areolar atrophic lesion. I got a OCTA done for in both and there were quiescent uh, vascular membranes sitting underneath even the uh, see, uh, even the atrophic uh, uh, area in the left eye. But that doesn't require treatment. You any, need to watch it and you need to warn the patient and ask him uh, for an AMSRA grade follow-up. Okay. Yes. Any way we can keep them quiescent for a longer time? So yes, you, you have to observe, but I monitor them very closely. Make sure AMSRA regular and once in three months they must report to you. So but no it's one. become my standard of care in dry RMD to get an OCT yeah. angiograph. True. What Thank is you. your uh, protocol of advising the patient AMSRA? Because I normally tell them once in two weeks to avoid making them overconscious 
of telling them to do it weekly. Yeah, I, if they have the non-aggregative CNVM, I meant to tell them, please do it weekly. But if the, if the OCTA doesn't pick up any flow, then once in two weeks is fine. But once a day, every day or <laughs> two days in over still will be. Yeah. If there are no further questions, we'll conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Unni, to a typical morning session at EIO.